the life of the world. And to know it, and his, and his people should never be discouraged because Jesus said, when you see these things, look up and know what? Your redemption draweth nigh. So we're not in despair as a church. We recognize that God is moving by his spirit. And we want to recognize that and share with others. Oh, let me not be remiss. Are there any visitors here in the church this morning? If there are, please stand and remain standing. State your name and where you're from. Any visitors at Bethel this morning? Please stand at this time. So we're all members. Amen. Blessed be the Lord. All right. So let us prepare our hearts for a wonderful story that will be given by John Hudson. God bless. Look at you, look at you. Boys and girls, good morning. Good morning. This side is, is, is great. I mean, come on this side. Hey, y'all, good, good morning. Ah, oh, I love it, I love it. Family, good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Okay, good. Now, think about this. I want y'all to think about this, right? Can you imagine? In fact, you know what? Before I even do that, let's do this correctly. Can you close your eyes and bow your heads? Close your eyes. Close your eyes and bow your heads. We're going to pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Our Lord, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. All right. Boys and girls, think about this. Imagine your home in your neighborhood and suddenly out of nowhere a stranger comes and he picks you up and he takes you away can you imagine that I, I, I don't want to I really don't want to this story starts out this way you can find this story in 2nd Kings verse 5 the Bible talks about a little maid she was from Israel. Israel. Israel is the country. Israel was having issues with another country. And during their little skirmishes, this little maid was taken away. And ironically, where she ended up was in the generals of the enemy's house. She became a maid to his wife. But somehow, someway, this little girl didn't allow her circumstances to dictate how she should behave. She behaved how her mommy and her daddy taught her, which is loving, with respect, and always thinking of God. Now, mind you, she's somewhere completely different. But somehow, this little girl, this little maid, was able to get the ear of her master. Her master's name was Naaman. Naaman, in the Bible, says he's a great general. He was a mighty general, a man of valor. But he had one issue. He had leprosy. Leprosy in those days was like uh, COVID-19 plus a thousand. 
It'll make your skin fall off and your ears and your nose. It was bad. The little girl said to his wife, if only he can go to Israel, there's a prophet there. Surely, if he sees this prophet, surely if he sees this prophet, he'll be healed. Now, mind you, she's a little slave girl. But by the way, she conducted herself. Despite her circumstances, she was listened to. And Naaman was desperate, too, because he wanted to be healed. So Naaman gets permission from his king. The king gives Naaman a letter. Go to Israel. Go get healed. Naaman's ready. Naaman's a proud man. He's a strong man. But he's a man full of pride. He gets to Elisha. This is the prophet's house. This is the prophet's name, Elisha. He gets to Elisha's house and he's thinking that Elisha's going to come out, do some hocus pocus. I don't know what he thought, but Naaman was furious when Elisha was sitting in his house and he simply told him, you know what? I want you to go to the Jordan and dip in there seven times. Naaman was furious. He was vexed. Because what the Bible doesn't tell you is that he went to Barbados and there was a beach called Brown's Beach and he, he went to the beaches there and the sea over there was, was fantastic. And now you're telling me I got to go to this Jordan river that's muddy and dirty and nasty and I got to dip in there and that's when it happened Naaman's name is spelled N-A-A M-A-N he changed his name at that minute he wasn't naming at that time he was like nah man I ain't going in there this is the Jordan River this is muddy this is uh uh but fortunately for him, he had good soldiers, and he listened to them. It's good to have good people and good friends around you. They were like, listen, hey, if he told you to do something great, you would do it, right? And Naaman was like, you know what, you're right. So he swallowed his pride. He went to the Jordan River. How many times he's supposed to dip? Seven. All right. He dipped once. Nothing. Twice. Still nothing. Three times. He was getting impatient, but he kept going. Four. Five. Six. We're going up to what? Seven. At the seventh time he came up, his skin was beautiful. The Bible says his skin was like a baby. It was smooth. It was clear. It was clean. He was happy. Now, this, Lord, this story says a lot of things. It starts off with the little girl. Because you never know, boys and girls, the way you conduct yourselves, you don't know who it might influence. Okay? It might encourage other boys and girls who might not believe what you believe, but they see how you act. And somehow the Holy Spirit impresses upon them, I want to be like that person. The story also lets us know that we need to swallow our pride and follow what God does for us. Allow God to work. Allow him to work in our lives, to trust him, and, and lean not on your own understanding. Okay? Keep that in mind. If you want to see the story, like I said, have mom and dad go to 2 Kings, verse 5. We done. We done. Who going to pray for me? Come here, Z. All right. You ready? All right, come on, come on, princess.
Dear Heavenly and Holy Father, we want to thank you for this day. Thank you for waking us up safely, and um, uh, and thank you for giving us all this food and a sh home and a home sh and shelter. And thank you for keeping us safe through life. And Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen, boys and girls. It was so happy to have y'all. Please go quickly but quietly back to your seats and have a happy Sabbath, okay? All right. Family, happy Sabbath. I'm back again. Can we all please stand? Uh, this is the call to worship. I was listening to a, um, a songwriter on my way to church this morning and basically he said that God is good. Is God only good when things are good? No. This is what he says. He says, may your struggles keep you near the cross. And may your troubles show that you need God. And may your battles end the way they should. And may your bad days prove that God is good. And most importantly, may your whole life prove that God is good. Family, please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, thank you. You have allowed us to stand on the ground another day. We are here this morning to, to worship and give you all the praise and worship. We're taking I out from us and we're only concentrating on you. Please be with us. Accept our worship. May it be as a sweet incense to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, I'm assuming it should be on the screen. We're going to read together Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. And it reads, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Happy Sabbath, family.
Catholic Church. Today's scripture reading will be taken from Philippians 3, verse 13 to 14. I will read in your hearing. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Bethel, it's prayer time. If you so desire, you may come forward to the place where prayer is being made. us who remain in the pews will kneel, kneel as far as possible. Those who come forward remain standing while I will, I will also stand. died on Calvary's cross that we through his death might have life and have it more abundantly Lord we thank you that you woke us up this morning in our right minds warm blood running through our vein Lord the room could have been a tomb and the bed could have been a cooling board but you sent the angel to touch us and wake us up you started us on our way and we are here in your house of worship for prayer. Our hearts are bowed lower than our knees, Lord. And we ask you to forgive us of our many sins, our shortcomings, and our failures. Forgive us all, Lord, so that our prayer may be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you did some things which we ought not to have done during the week. And some things that we should have known, we didn't do them. We ask your forgiveness. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord so that this prayer may ascend to you. Father, our needs are many. We, our needs differ. Some of us need jobs. Some of us need a place to live. Some of us, when you looked in the, when you looked in the cupboard, there's no food. The bills are high and the funds are low. But you told us that you will supply all our needs. And Lord, we are claiming that by faith. Please supply our needs, Lord. And if we ever need, we have needs and we need you, Lord. If we ever needed you, we need you today, right now. Come down and be with us, Lord. There are many among our number who are ill. We heard, Lord, that Sister Murray had a, a, an incident this morning and she's either going to or going to the hospital. We ask you, Lord, to just be with her. There are others among us who are ill as well. Many of us, we have problems. We are sick in ways that we, we dare not even tell anyone. But Lord, we know that you're the great healer. 
You're the great physician. One touch, one touch from you. Cancer will flee. Lupus will flee. Diabetes, high blood pressure, and the cardiovascular problems will all go. Those errant cells which are running around in our bodies, we know you can rein them in. And with one touch, you bring us back to perfect health. Father, we seem as if we have been in a, a continuous, a perpetual season of mourning in this church. People are dying left, right, and center. Oh Lord, this morning we have many families who are hurting, who are bereaved, they're, they're, they're mourning the loss of their loved ones. The Anderson family, the big Ebanks family, Sister Taylor. Lord, we, some of us have, have, have lost loved ones from much from much longer time, and it still hurts. So we ask you, Lord, to please wrap your loving arms around us and comfort us. Comfort us in, 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 in ways in which no other person can. You promise that you send us the comfort, and we're asking you, Lord, to do that for us. Even today, Lord, your servant, Dr. Richards, will ascend to the podium in a little while to speak to us. We are asking that whatever he says, Lord, it will be coming from you. And as he speaks to us, may some heart be touched. May our life be changed. And may we all go forward being better persons and yeah, even better Christians. Telling someone about your love and your sacrifice on Calvary's cross for us. Father, once more, please forgive us of our many sins and our shortcomings and our failures. Do for us all those things we cannot do for ourselves. Bless us as we cannot bless ourselves. And ultimately, when you shall return, Lord, may we all have a home in your kingdom. This is our earnest prayer and wish. In Jesus' worthy name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Church, may the deacons and ushers please come forward. May the deacons and ushers please come forward. forgiveness for all for sin. As we are about to collect your offering today, dear God, please help that it will hasten your footsteps and help to further your work in the world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Today's offertory comes from Heather Thompson Day. She writes, One day, several years ago, while I was teaching one of my college communication courses, a student of mine entered the classroom 
after the lesson had already begun. She looked visibly tired and in bad shape, and I decided not to make a big deal about her coming late. Later after class, the stu later after class, the student came into my office and explained her chargeness. I got the news that my mother had died this morning, and I just didn't know where to go. My heart sank, but I also felt a spark of hope at the moment. I grieved with my student for the great loss of her family and the emotions that she was experiencing. I also praised God that while the student was, was away from her home, she felt her classroom was a safe space for her to find refuge. The church can be that place for many people as well. When you walk in each and every Sabbath, we are not always aware of the burdens those around us are carrying to church. A church is more than a building. A church is us, the people, who lean on one another to help create a safe space for others to carry our burdens. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now, where saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open out the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be enough room to receive it. We give thee but thine own. We give thee but thine own. gentlemen come up. Amen. Happy Sabbath church. Don't worry brother Gene, I'm eager to hear you as well so uh, I'll be quick with it. It is my honor today to introduce today's divine worship speaker. My dad, <laughs> Dr. Rory Richards. My dad finds great joy in working in the master's service. If there is a need, he will not hesitate to jump in. He has served in multiple roles in the church, including deacon, health ministry leader, and Sabbath school teacher, among others. Currently, in addition to serving as an elder, he serves as a member of the communications and community services departments. My dad loves his, wa his wife and his family. <laughs> In addition to his wife, Ayana, he has five children. I am his youngest child, Raimi. Two granddaughters and one grandson as well. 
He is a professor of English at New York City College of Technology of the City of University of New York and in the Integrated Business Applications at Monroe College. He holds a, a doctorate in higher education leadership. My dad is humbled by the opportunity to present the word of God. As he presents, I ask for him your prayerful attention that we may each receive a blessing. After the hymn of meditation, the next voice you will hear will be that of my dad, Elder Dr. Rory Richards. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Regardless of what you've been through this week, can you just say to yourself, it is well. Yeah, a little louder, come on. It is well. Hallelujah. Some songs need a melody but then there are some songs that need to be professed and I believe that this song today the words that will be uttered I pray that it would uplift those who are going through amen everyone hallelujah Oh, my soul, my sin, oh, 
say amen and go home that was a sermon right there wasn't it whatever my lot thou has taught me to say it is well it is well with my soul happy sabbath everyone what a blessing it is to be in the house of the lord david said i was glad when they said Let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen, amen. What about that story from Brother Hudson? The, 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 the beach in Barbados. <laughs> now, I'm not trying to start any trouble here, but which Caribbean island do you think has the best beach? Uh, I'm not trying to start any trouble now. Listen, they all have beautiful beaches in the Caribbean. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. You know, I want to thank the pastor, Dr. Dion T. Harrigan, for allowing me the opportunity to stand in his pulpit. This is an awesome uh, privilege and a responsibility to speak to the children of God. Because the Bible in Jeremiah 23, uh, one warns against preachers 
that scatter the children of Israel. He says, woe unto preachers who scatter the children, who preach a false doctrine. So coming before the children of the Lord, the people of God, is serious business. It's not a business of frivolity, even though we will have joy because the joy of the Lord is our strength. But it's one that we have to approach intentionally. So I want to say thank you to the pastor that he had the confidence uh, or that the Lord led him to ask me to speak today. I also want to say thank you to my son Raimi for that introduction. I knew nothing about it. Um, Elder Ben just asked me a while ago, who's introducing you? And I said, nobody, because I was just going to come up and speak. And, I, and Elder Ben said, OK, I'll do it. And I stepped outside, and I said, let me come back inside, because Elder Ben is going to be doing the introduction, only to see Raimi up here, that tall, handsome young man. <laughs> giving the introduction, and he, he was so gracious about it. Um, he did say I'm a humble man. I, I don't know how humble I am. You know, I tend to be a bit arrogant, but I'm still under construction. God is still working on the building. He's still lifting me up and taking me to higher heights. Praise God. And of course, I want to acknowledge the love of my life, my wife. You see, every now and then, God sends someone in your life to pick you up and lead you out of darkness. It was a time I didn't know what to do with myself. And Sister Richards came into my life and do what you women so famously do. You, 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 you dust things off and you organize the place and you set things straight. That's right. Amen. Amen. And, and, and so here I am today. Praise God. Eh? You know, a lot has happened in the world this week. A lot has happened in our country this week. Men's hearts are failing them for fear. People are wondering, Elder Bell, what in the world is going on? He ended the week last week, Brother Rose, with an assassination attempt on a former president. It's not the first time America has experienced something like this, but it comes at a time where there are deep divisions within our society. It comes at a time where people cannot agree to disagree. We can't even have a civil conversation anymore. We're at each other's throats. And you wonder to yourself, what's going to happen? Dr. Khan, there were tornadoes and storms in New York. Church roof is, roofs blowing off. B-52 bombers being crippled. Storms and Natural disasters. We're halfway through the year and the damage done by wildfires in California is equal to the damage of the entire year last year. And we're only halfway through. I believe it's almost time for the Lord to come. 
What about you? But you know, no matter what you feel about our leadership, our political leadership, or candidates, Joe Biden or Donald Trump, we have a responsibility to pray for them. Pray for Donald Trump. Pray for Joe Biden. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 2, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for some people, a few people, for all people, for kings and those in authority. that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. If the king is not happy, no one is happy. If the leader is not happy, the country is not happy. So we must pray for our leaders. I guess the final thing I'm going to say on that is you all have a sacred responsibility to vote. Blood, sweat, and tears went into that privilege. You didn't just earn it for the black race. It wasn't just given to you. It was fought for. People died for it. History will reveal that if you do not utilize it, woe be unto you. You don't have a say. So vote. Exercise your right. But for God's sakes, do not vote for a personality. Vote for an agenda. Vote for an agenda that works toward your best benefit. Do not vote against your own self-interest. Mercy. Mercy. I'm not saying it. But make sure you study the issues. And whichever agenda you feel will advance the best interest of yourself, your family, and the people around you, vote for it. Not for a personality. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Unclean hands, unclean mouth, unclean body is what I present to you, O oh God. Ask him that you will wash me in the blood and clean me. And then speak through me so that your people will receive a word in due season. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen, amen. Southern state leaders have a history of wanting to take us back to slavery or trying to justify its reason for being. And this sentiment was reflected by Florida's governor, Ron DeSantis, who claimed the black people gained personal benefits from slavery. As reported in the July 23, 23 edition of the Business Insider, 
DeSantis was defending the state's move to include so-called benefits of slavery in the curriculum. This was a blatant and tragic rewriting of one of the darkest periods of American history. Let me be clear, slavery did not benefit black people in America. No. Let me repeat that because I don't think you heard it. I think some of you believe it. Slavery did not benefit black people in America, in Africa, or anywhere in the world. Amen. To DeSantis's chagrin, of course, the black community took umbrage to these comments. And on July 31st, 2021, our own Hakeem Jeffries minority leader of the U.S. House of Representatives responded by saying slavery was a racist, oppressive, evil crime against humanity, which involved the kidnapping of our people, the rape, torture, and lynching of our men, women, and children. Sister Richards, we thought this was the end of that. But that wasn't the case. On June 4th of this year, at a Trump campaign rally, Representative Brian Donald suggested that black families were better off during the Jim Crow era. Again, Hakeem Jeffries responded to Rep. Brian Donalds. A visibly emotional Jeffries said, Mr. Speaker, it has come to my, I'm quoting here, Mr. Speaker, it has come to my attention that a so-called leader has made the factually inaccurate statement that black folks were better off during Jim Crow. That's an outlandish, outrageous, and out-of-pocket observation. We were not better off when young, a young boy named Emmett Till could be brutally murdered without consequences because of Jim Crow. We were not better off when black women could be sexually assaulted without consequences because of Jim Crow. We were not better off when people could be systematically lynched without consequences because of Jim Crow. We were not better off when children could be denied high quality education without consequences because of Jim Crow. We were not better off when people could be denied the right to vote without consequences because of Jim Crow. How dare you make such an ignorant observation? You better check yourself before you wreck yourself. Come on. End of quote. I have entitled this sermon, Check Yourself Before You Wreck Yourself. Now, I know I did pray earlier, but someone told me, Brother Rose, that more prayer means more power. And I need some power, Brother Roger, to preach this sermon. So we're going to pray again. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I ask that your holy anointing will be upon me. Move me away and hide me behind the cross so that Christ will be lifted up. So that all men, women, boys and girls will be drawn to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Why is it that people always want to go back to a bad situation? Why do we view the past more fondly than the present? You know, we're always talking about how the past was better than the present. I know. My Bethel family likes to talk about when we used to put down chairs in the aisles. 
and the church was full. And ministry seemed to be working. And it was. Amen. Amen. But you know, we tend to see the past through rose-colored lenses, even if it was horrible. The tendency to view the past through rose-colored lenses is called rosy retrospection. That is actually a term, it's a theory. Researchers Mitchell et al. 1997 explained that it is a cognitive bias where our memory of events is more positive than the actual experience was. I wish I had someone here to talk to me about that. And that's why you could have a representative talking about we were better off during Jim Crow. When because of Jim Crow, we were, as black people, marginalized, suppressed, oppressed, and pushed to the edge of society. We were denied the basic right to intergenerational wealth. Red, redlining created a line down our communities where our children, our offsprings, could not gain wealth like other offsprings. In fact, it's estimated that if we were supposed to or would be able to even bridge the wealth gap that exists between white and gap, it would take us at least 70 years. Now, now listen, we, for every $100 that white, the white community earns, the black community earns, Nine dollars. Have mercy, Jesus. You didn't hear what I just said. For every hundred dollars that a white brother and sisters earn, the black community earns approximately nine dollars. No, that's serious. But yet some people think that we were better off. So this idea of rosy retrospection where our memory of events is more positive than the experiences. During Jim Crow, there were over 400 lynchings of men, women, and children. Now I have a book at home. It's called Without a Sanctuary, Lynching Photography in America. And Latwick has a chapter in it. It's called Hellhounds. Hellhounds. And in that chapter, he describes one of the most diabolical scenes in the history of America, where Robert Johnson was falsely accused of raping a white woman. Now brace yourselves for this one. He was chained to a tree had his ears, fingers, and genitals cut off, then his face skinned, his face skinned, he was then doused with kerosene, Raimi, and then kerosene wood was stacked around him and lit a fire. Latwick reports that over 2,000 people came to watch the spectacle. Prominent citizens were reported in the newspaper as saying it was a great day in America. Rosy retrospection. A 1937 poem, Strange Fruit, written by Abel Mirapool and sung by Billie Holiday, later sung by Nina Simone, captures 
the experience of the lynching in this way. Southern trees bearing strange fruit. Blood on the leaves and blood on the roots. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. Yet some people try to argue that black people were better off during this period. You better check yourself before you wreck yourself. But the thing, Elder Skinner, is that rosy retrospection is not unique to the Jim Crow era. If you come with me to approximately 4,000 years ago, the Bible records over 15 different times when the children of Israel rebelled against Moses and said, we want to go back to Egypt. Back to the place of slavery. Back to the place of oppression. Back to the place where their firstborn were killed and murdered. Women raped. They wanted to go back to Egypt, Sister Mina. In Exodus 14, after experiencing God's mighty deliverance through 10 plagues, the last of which saw God killing all the firstborn of Egypt, and by the way, Brother Ward, I wish, I wish I had Brother Ward here with me. By the way, the killing of the firstborn in Egypt was God's retribution for the killing of the firstborn during the birth of Moses. Listen to me. What goes around comes around. God will not be mocked. As a man soweth, so shall he reap. So God was showing who was in charge. But after experiencing all of this, Israel found themselves in the unenviable position of running from Pharaoh and his armies. They had the sea before them, Pharaoh behind them, and the mountains surrounding them. They were trapped. They didn't know what to do. How did they respond? Listen to what they said in Exodus 14, 11, and 12. Wasn't there enough room in Egypt to bury us? Is that why you brought us out here to die in the desert? Why did you bring us out of Egypt anyway? While we were there, didn't we tell you, leave us alone? We'd rather be slaves in Egypt than die in the desert. The people would rather be slaves than die in the desert. I, I, I can't help but thinking of the song, Oh Freedom. Oh, freedom, before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my father. Freedom. Yet, God told them to go forward. He parted the Red Sea, and before their very eyes, they saw Pharaoh and his armies. Perish, Elder Klinsgale. Now, Elder Klinsgale, the Bible says that all night, God caused a strong east wind to blow. And the wind parted the Red Sea, and the sea was like walls around the children of Israel. Can you imagine 10 story high walls? Any one of those buildings? Downtown Brooklyn, 100 feet, Elder Robinson told, says, 
Can you imagine passing through the sea of 100 foot water walls around you? And you're passing through on dry land. Have mercy. What an experience. I know some of you are saying, man, if I experienced that, I would never distrust God again. <laughs> Praise God. I see my friend, Brother Mark Parkinson and Sister and I are here. Praise God for my friend. We are soldiers in arms. But I don't want you to miss an important lesson here that needs to be learned. Uh, one of which is that an important component of the Christian experience is that we walk not by sight, but by what? By faith. Ellen White says, and I'm paraphrasing right here, that God brought them to this position to test their faith and to demonstrate his power, thereby building their trust in him. She further states, and I'm quoting now, Often the Christian life is beset by dangers and duty seems hard to perform. The imagination pictures impending ruin before and bondage or death behind. Yet the voice of God speaks clearly. Go forward. We should, not, we should obey this command even though our eyes cannot penetrate the darkness and we feel the cold waves about our feet. Go forward. She goes on to say, the obstacles that hinder our progress will never disappear before a halting, doubting spirit. Bethel, our obstacles will not disappear if we doubt and if we halt. We got to trust God and go forward. Here's what she says, unbelief. Sorry, those who defer obedience till every shadow of uncertainty disappears and there remains no risk of failure or defeat will never obey at all, Brother Ward. Unbelief whispers, let us wait till the obstructions are removed. Anybody ever experienced this? The Lord has told you to do something. And you know the Lord has told you to do it, but there seems to be obstacles all around you. And you're hesitating. You will not move because the obstacles are there. The Lord is saying, go forward, Sister Bell. Don't be afraid. If he tells you to do something, you do it. You don't hesitate. He says, but faith courageously urges an advance, hoping all things, believing all things. And this is found in Patriots and Prophets, uh, page 290, the second paragraph. I didn't make it up. Israel rebellion continues. In Exodus 16, 2, 3, the children of Israel murmured and rebelled in the wilderness of sin between Elim and Sinai with, when they felt hungry. The Bible says, listen to what they said this time. The whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. Have mercy, Lord. When we sat by the pots of meat, the King James Version says the flesh pots. When we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly. This is after God performed 10 miracles, took them out of Egypt, parted the Red Sea, and now they feel hungry and they're complaining that they would have preferred to die before the flesh pots in Egypt. Have mercy, Lord. 
How many of us, whenever the bank account gets low, we begin to complain about the God? God, I paid my tithe and offering, and now you make this happen. Maybe I shouldn't have returned my tithe and offering. How many of us, when things not going right with our children, we, we begin to complain, Lord, I raised them up the right way. And I've been walking with you. I've been serving in this department and doing this for you. Maybe I shouldn't have spent so much time with that. It's the human condition. Yet, even though they complained and rebelled, God still fed them. In fact, this was where God first gave them manna, the bread of angels. God fed them because my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. What a blessing that is. To know that as children of the living God, he provide all your needs. The psalmist said, I was young, now I'm old. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. <laughs> they complained for hunger, God fed them. Again in Numbers 20, they complained, this time for thirst. And this caused Moses to disobey God, sin, consequently losing his opportunity to enter the earthly promised land. The earthly promised land, Brother Ward. But I thank God that Jesus Christ himself came for that body and he's now residing in heaven. Uh, thank God. You can find that in Jude, by the way. Don't be afraid to go and read Jude. It's one chapter, an easy read. Now, here's the coup d'etat of this whole thing. When Moses went to receive the commandments from God and the people complained about his absence, he's receiving the commandments of God. The people begin to complain about his absence, and then they forsake the Lord by creating a golden calf and altar and began to worship him. This time they did not only complain, they spiritually went back to Egypt. Now, 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 let me, let me explain that because some of you are saying, huh? What do you mean spiritually went back to Egypt? Well, you must note that Egypt in the Bible does not only represent a geographical location. It's a spiritual location also. It's the condition of the mind. While the children of Israel were enslaved in Egypt physically, they were also spiritually enslaved. They worshipped false idols. They did not remember the true Sabbath. They ate all kinds of things. Their lives was wrapped up in paganism. So when they said, would that we had died before the flesh pots, they had actually, spiritually, gone back to captivity. And, you know, I have to talk about this a little bit because this is an important concept. When God delivered the children of Israel from Egypt, he delivered them with a high hand. And the night of their deliverance, they ate the Passover. And what does that look like? What did that look like? Well, they killed a lamb without blemish. And they had to smear or wipe the blood of that lamb over their doorpost. Why? Because the angel of the Lord was going to pass through that night to kill all the firstborn. And any doorpost that he did not see the blood on, the firstborn would be killed. You see, this blood on the doorpost could be applied to anybody in Egypt, not just the Israelites. So if an Egyptian heard about it, got wind of it, and decided, you know what, I'm killing this lamb and painting the blood over my doorpost, they would be saved. Right. 
Now, what's the importance of this? This Passover, Elder Ben, pointed to our Paschal Lamb, Jesus Christ, who would have died. You see, the blood of Jesus is what rescues us from our sins. What can wash away all my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me pure and clean? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the blood that makes me white and pure. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. If you're sitting here and you're not covered in the blood of Jesus, you can't be saved. The church building can't save you. The person sitting beside you can't save you. Your mother can't save you. Your father can't save you. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can save you. The Bible says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you do not come through the gate of Jesus Christ, you can cannot be saved you gotta hear me now I'm a fourth fourth generation seventh-day Adventist my great-grandmother was a seventh-day Adventist my grandmother was a seventh-day Adventist my mother was a seventh-day Adventist now I'm a seventh-day Adventist but it can't save me If I don't apply to the blood of Jesus, I am lost. Anybody sitting in here who has not applied to the blood of Jesus? If you're sitting here, now is the time. If you feel that wrestling in your heart, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. If you're wondering if you can do it tomorrow, well, I don't know the future. I don't. But I do know that Paul was talking to King Agrippa. And he said, almost you persuaded me to be a Christian. Hmm. And he didn't accept. And he was lost. Tomorrow is not promised to anyone. You don't know if you live to see the rising sun. Now is the time of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Make a decision for Christ even as I'm speaking. Keep thinking about that. Now, just as how God freed Israel from Egypt, he frees us from the Egypt of our sins. Why did he have to do that? You see, we are naturally sinful. David says he was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did his mother conceive him. He argues that human beings naturally want to sin. Now, because we are drawn to sin, even when we don't want to, and Paul explains it this way, the good I would do, I do not. But the evil which I would not do, that I do. It's a natural human tendency. And unless we are fortified by Jesus Christ, we're going to fall into the trap. Here's what James says in James 1, 14 to 15. Each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Your own desires draw you away. We are naturally tended towards sin. Oh, how the world with evil allures me. Oh, how my heart is tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus all of my sorrows. Jesus can help me. Jesus alone. So, in all of this, because we're naturally tended to sin, it means that we have to be intentional about our lives. It means that we can't be arbitrary 
about how we live. We don't take our steps by chance. We ask the Lord to order our steps in his way. So that every step that we take is ordered by God. It means that we have to continually check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. Now, you're asking me, how do you check yourself, Elder Richards? Well, I'll give you three quick ways on how to check yourself. The first way of checking yourself is that you must examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Corinthians 13, 5 says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? And that's the NIV version. But how do you really examine yourself? How do you really test yourself to see if Christ lives in you? Well, if you are in the faith, the Spirit of God dwells in you according to Romans 8, 9. And if Christ is in you, you are dead to the world and sin. That's according to Romans 8, 10. Now, Paul in Romans points out that the carnal mind is enmity against God. That is, the mind without Christ is enmity, with, is enmity to God. So then... If you don't have faith in Christ, you cannot please him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because God is and is a rewarder of those who what? Diligently seek him. Ephesians 13, 17 says, let Christ dwell in your heart. Bible says, behold, I knock at the door. If any man open, I will come in and sup with him. Check yourself to see whether or not you're supping with Christ or supping with another spirit. 1 John 4, 1 says, test the spirit. Mercy. Test the spirit. Not all spirits are of Christ. Amen. Not all spirits are of God. Verse 2 actually gives you the criteria for how to test the spirit. If the spirit declares that Jesus Christ came in the flesh and is God, then it's the spirit of God. But if you find yourself justifying sin, then that is not the spirit of God. You better check yourself before you wreck yourself. If you find yourself wanting to go back to the club, wanting to go back to rolling that blunt, wanting to take up that alcohol bottle, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself because that is not the spirit of God. Mercy. Now, now, now what does... does Paul actually mean when he says examine yourself? Well, there, there are two ways here that you can examine yourself. Really examine yourself. One is through introspection. You know, when you take stock of your life, you see where you're going, where you're coming from. You look at your associates and, and you look at what your, your goals and your dreams are. You spend time with God in that introspection. Another way is through something called metacognition. Oh, I wish I had Dr. Khan up here to preach this sermon. Metacognition. And what that simply means is that you begin to think about how you think. Huh. What do you mean, Elder Richards? Well, what I mean is that you begin to think about how do I process information? How do I learn? How do I interact with the world around me? In other words, how do I interact with my God? 
How do I process information about Jesus Christ? How do I build my relationship with him? It's deeper than just checking yourself. It's checking your mind. Because what you begin to do is not just look at the conscious, Brother Roger Jean. You're looking at the subconscious. What's behind the thoughts that you're thinking? What drives your action? Is it the Lord Jesus Christ and him crucified? Or is it your selfish motivation? When you practice metacognition, you begin to question yourself, why do you serve God? Do I serve him just for an outcome? Do I serve him because of what he's done for me? That's the accusation that, that Satan made against Job. When, said, when God said to Satan, have you considered, he's boasting on on, on his servant Job. Have you considered my servant Job? A man upright and perfect. Satan said he's, oh, he only serves you because you have planted a hedge around him. But take away all that he has and see if he doesn't curse you. That's the accusation that Satan made. So I'm asking you and the practice of metacognition pushes you to question why do you serve God? Do you serve him because he's God, creator of all the world, the omniscient, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent God, the one who rescued you from your sins, the one who shows up and shows out every time you need him? Or do you serve him because maybe you drive a fancy car? Or you have that big house. Now, the other way that you um, examine yourself and check yourself before you wreck yourself is by humbling yourself before God. In Matthew 23, 11 and 12, let's turn to that scripture. You have your Bibles here with you. I know you do. That's, you, you came to church with your Bibles. Matthew 23, 11 and 12. Listen to what the Lord says. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. In order to examine yourself and check yourself to see if the spirit dwells in you, you have to humble yourself before God. James 4.6 says, God resists the proud. James 4.10 and Peter 5.6 5, 6 says, you need to humble yourself before the mighty hand of God and he will uplift you. What does it mean to humble yourself? It means submit yourself to each other. Don't think you know it all. If you're leaders, if you're a leader, don't close ranks. Keep yourself open to new ideas. If you don't do that, you'll stagnate. Humble yourself so that you can grow. Ah, Dr. Richards, you just earned your doctorate. You're walking up and down with your head held high with a hearty look. You can't even call the saints anymore. You can't deliver any books anymore. You better humble yourself before God. You better check yourself before you wreck yourself. You see, if things not going right, humble yourself. If there's a storm in your life, humble yourself. If you didn't get the job, humble yourself. If you've risen to a position where you're leading multiple ministries, humble yourself. 
If you work for a danger doctorate, humble yourself. If your life is barren, humble yourself. If your land is a desert, humble yourself. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal their land. Third and final ways to connect with and stay connected to God. Turn your Bibles with me to John 15, 45. When you find it, say amen. I think I heard one amen there, so we'll go forward. John 15, 45 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth what? Much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. God is the true vine. It is in him we live and move and have our very being. If we don't connect to God... You cannot grow as a Christian. The very principle of the Christian walk demands a connection to Jesus Christ, who is the true vine. If you're separated for him, from him, you can do nothing. Your power comes from Jesus Christ. Your healing comes from Jesus Christ. Your success comes from Jesus Christ. Your restoration comes from Jesus Christ. Your revival and reformation comes from Jesus Christ. How can you be a Christian if you're not connected to him? Zechariah 1 verse 3 says, Turn to God and he will turn to you. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Hmm. The only way to cleanse your hands and purify your heart is with a connection to Jesus Christ. Timothy 2, 15 says, study to show thyself approved. A workman need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Let's stop there a little bit and talk a little bit about this. When you study the word of God, you study it so you don't have to be ashamed. When conversations about God comes up or when the enemy attacks you, you study to show yourself approved so that when it is needed, you will not be ashamed because guess what? You will be able to rightly divide the word. That is, you'll be able to accurately speak about the word. Your interpretations will not be all over the place. You'll not be talking about some new age stuff. You'll be talking about the true gospel word of God. Study to show yourself approved. But it goes further than that. 2 Peter 2, 1 to 2 warns, and this is the reason why you have to study to show yourself approved. It warns us that false teachers will arise who will be teaching a different kind of gospel, a spurious gospel. 2 Timothy 4, 3 tells us, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. If you don't study the word of God and be deep in the word of God, you'll believe anything. If you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. You got to know this word of God, especially in the times that we're living in.
Because false teachers are all over the place. False Christ, there are people in Florida claiming to be Christ. Huh. 2 Corinthians 11, um, 13 and 15 says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, it goes on to say. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Mercy. Things are serious in these end times. You better walk swiftly through these streets. You better call upon the name of the Lord while he's near. You better resist the devil so that he can flee from you. You better call upon the name of the Lord because whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Don't waste time in these streets, ladies and gentlemen. Look not to the left, not to the right, Raimi. Stay focused on Jesus Christ. Let him be the author and finisher of your faith, son. But even though we have false prophets and false teachers, I thank God that God is not sleeping. Because he says in Jeremiah 23, 1 and 2, Woe unto the pastors that lead his people astray. I want you to hear me now. But you don't have to be led astray. Because John 8, 32 says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Set you free. And if the Father sets you free, you are what? Free, free indeed. So study to show yourself approved. Yes, study the word of God. Find some time during the day. Read a chapter. Read a scripture. What works for everybody won't necessarily work for you. Some people can take up the Bible and read it from cover to cover. Some people have to go to one book and then go to another book. Nothing wrong with that. The word of God is alive and sharper than a two-edged sword. Take up this Bible. Whether it's a physical Bible or one on your phone. And turn to a chapter each morning and read a couple of verses. I thank God for Sister Ramona who never ceases to send out a scripture. Every day she sends it. On Sundays she presents a theme. And then throughout the week, the scriptures that she sends out follow this theme. I thank God for Dr. Khan, who ensures that we have a Sabbath school Bible study every Sabbath morning. I praise God for Sister Kimberly and Sister Andra and Sister Caleb, who are on the Sabbath school podcast every other week. Young women on the battlefield for their Lord, studying the word of God, dispensing the word of God, rightly dividing the word of truth. So then, the evidence of being connected to God after you've studied the word, after you've examined yourself, after you've tested the spirit, is that you bear fruit. It's that you bear fruit. And if we go to Galatians, turn with me to Galatians. Galatians 5, 21 and 22. I'm sorry. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It says, the fruit of the Spirit is what? Read with me. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. 
Notice it doesn't say bear fruits, you know. It's a fruit. One fruit manifests all of these different dimensions, these different characteristics. There is one triune God, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. There is one fruit of the Spirit. And if you're connected to him, you will begin to bear these fruit. Now don't kill yourself because sanctification is the work of a lifetime. You won't bear all this fruit at the same time. The disciples walked with Jesus for three years. And even upon the night of his crucifixion, Peter denied him with cursings. He wasn't saved, yet he was set aside as a disciple. But he was growing in grace. Give yourself time to grow in grace. And finally, forsake not the assembling of the saints. If you want to connect to God, stay connected to his church. Don't listen to anyone telling you that the church is this and the church is that. The church has too many hypocrites. Well, that's why we come here. Because we want to be washed in the blood. And we want to be cleansed by his blood. We want to be renewed. The Bible says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech thee, brethren, by the mercies of God. We read it every day. That you present your body as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That is when you begin to connect with God, your mind becomes renewed, becomes transformed. The things you used to do, you do them no more. The things you used to love, you love them no more. The places you used to go, you don't go there no more. The things you used to watch, you stop watching them. You're careful about what you put in your mind. You're careful about what you spend time with. Who you spend time with. That's connecting with God. And then you'll be able to say, as Paul said in Philippians 3, 13 to 40, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying that he, appre he doesn't think, he doesn't claim to have apprehended. And apprehend means to seize or to hold or to gain. And he says he doesn't claim to have apprehended the price. But guess what? I'm forgetting the past and I'm moving forward to that high calling. I'm forgetting my past misdeeds, all my destructive ways, all my sorrows, all my pains. And I'm moving on to Jesus Christ. God says be strong and of good courage. He will carry you through. Don't forget to trust in the Lord, folks. Allow him to lead you. Your past might not necessarily be the best. I can tell you about a young man who struggled with his life. A gifted young man who God blessed. Gave him all the opportunities you could ever see. You could ever gain. A young man who sat in the highest halls of government. Next in line to the minister of state. A young man who lost his way. And, and somehow couldn't find his way back. Because he stepped away from his God.
a young man who was out there in the wind, going from bottle to bottle, trying this drugs and that drugs. A young man who found himself moving from one bosom of one woman to another just to drown his sorrows. And one day, one day God called him and said, Hey, you boy, come back to me. It's been 18 years now. <laughs> August 12, 2006. A sermon was being preached by Pastor Knight over there in California. Call and response. Well, the Holy Spirit called and I responded. I didn't know when I reached up to the altar with tears flowing down my eyes. But all I know is that the Holy Spirit called me back, Elder Ben. All I know is that I didn't want to smoke a cigarette anymore. I didn't want to drink anymore. I didn't want to roll up a blunt anymore. I didn't want to sit behind a crack pipe anymore. Yeah, young people, this is Elder Richards here. And I know some of you are going through some stuff. I know some of you are going through some stuff. I hear. I know what's happening, young people. The devil is trying to sift you like wheat. Don't let him move you out of this church. Hold on to your God. I've lived that life so you don't have to live it. You got me, Raimi? I've done all of that. Ain't nothing you can think of that I haven't done. And I'm not exaggerating. The deepest, darkest places you can think of. Washing my hands day after day and they just won't get clean. Stick with your God. Connect with him and stay connected with him. Examine yourself to ensure that the Holy Spirit is in you. And don't you dare walk away from him. Not in these times. You know, in my tears, as we close this thing down, I know there's someone who wants to take the opportunity to give their life to Christ. I know there's someone who doesn't want to go back to where they're coming from, who doesn't have a rosy retrospection of their life. I know there's someone who realizes that their lives are not going the way that it should. You want to give your life to Christ. I don't want you to be afraid to come down to the front. I really don't want you to be afraid to do that. But I'm inviting you now down to the front. I know the Holy Spirit is tugging at your heart. I know he's moving in this place right now. And there's somebody who says, you know what? Should I give my life to Christ or should I not? Someone is vacillating. I want you to think about all I've said. You see, God is calling you. He's calling you to him. And this is not a time for laughter and giggling. This is a serious time. This is a life and death time. 
were my prayer warriors. I needed to be bowed in prayer at this time. There's someone wrestling with God today. And he's calling you. Will you come forward? Will you give your life to the Lord today? Will you say, Jesus, I want to go all the way with you. Is there anyone? Don't be afraid to give your life to Christ. The person beside you can't save you. The person whispering in your ear right now, they can't save you. Come home to Jesus. My next appeal is for those who have accepted Jesus Christ and you have determined in your life that you're not going back to where you're coming from. You're moving forward. If you've determined this in your life, why don't you come forward? You've given your life to Christ. And you've determined that you're not going back to where you're coming from. Why don't you come forward? Come forward. Come forward. There's still time to come if you want to give your life to Christ. If you don't want to stand up, put your hand up for Jesus Christ. Don't let the opportunity pass you by. I don't mean to put fear in anybody's heart at the bell, but today could be the last opportunity. Come forward, folks. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God for his people. Brother Robbie. Where's Brother Robbie? Where's Elder Rock Ward? Come forward, Elder Ward. I want you both to pray for your people. One prayer from Brother Robbie and a prayer from Elder Ward. Pray that those who are hesitating, who are vacillating between a yes and a no, will give their lives to Christ. Pray for those who have decided that they're not going back. Eritrea, you don't dare go back, you know. You don't dare go back. You stay with the God that your mother taught you about. Pray for your people, Brother Robbie. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you once more. We tarry yet a little bit longer to present your people. And in so presenting them, I present myself as well. Lord, we dare not go back into the enemy's camp. We resolve to move forward, Lord. Because we, we are confident that every day with you is better than the day before. We ask you now, Lord, to seal these, these, these decisions. May we never, ever go back into the Egyptian state of mind. But we press forward to the mark of the high calling in Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask you to bless every word that was said to us today. And may we bind them in our hearts and resolve to keep pressing forward. Forgive us, Lord, and bless us. And ultimately, when you come, save every one of us here under the sound of my voice is my prayer in Jesus' word and name. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this privilege that you have called all of us to be workers in your vineyard. You have called us to be a people who would stand for the right though the heavens fall. 
you have called all of us as young men, as young women, to be servants of thine. We pray and ask, Lord, that you may give us the strength and the power that we will not go back to that place where we once dwelt. Bless us, dear God, with the Holy Spirit working in our minds that we, do, we would be strong as men and women, as servants of thine. Give us the power through your Holy Spirit because you've said in your word that as many that have received Jesus, to them give he power to become sons and daughters of God. Bless your church today. Bless your people. Help us to be strong and courageous and to go forward with you, working in your vineyard to bring men and women to know and to serve you so that we all will be saved when you come. This we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Robbie. Thank you, Brother Ward. You may go be seated. thankful for the word for today. We invite you at this time to please stand as we sing our closing hymn, Marching to Zion.
city of God, the beautiful city of God, the beautiful city of God. brought to us and apply it to our daily lives. Continue to guide us in your ways that we may shine like a bright light for your people. May God fill us with love, joy, and peace now and forevermore. In your holy name we do pray, amen. Shine upon you and be gracious. 